Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, Hal Neller joins us. Hal is a consultant, a broadcast consultant, an engineer from Florida, and he's got some good ideas about the five things you need to be aware of for your FM transmitter site. Five things that you need to make sure are in place and working well to help keep your site happy and healthy. It's all coming up next on Twirt. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcaster's General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support. Online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we're talking about everything from the microphone to that light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. It is a typical cold and uh, cloudy November day here in Nashville. We had a low of about 24 degrees overnight. Ooh, it was cold last night. Uh, Chris Tarr is normally with us and can't be today. Being winter, he's he's a little sick. He's under the weather. He's been uh, soldiering on as best he could for the last couple episodes, but he says, no, nah, not going to do it. No, nah, can't can't talk long enough to be on the show. So Chris, we wish you well. And anyone else, any of the rest of you who are sick uh, with this flu or COVID or a creeping crud or bronchitis, man, I hope you get better. I, I know some uh, some children have had RSV this uh, this season, so it's it's not good. Please stay healthy. Hope you hope you do. Uh, we're talking with a gentleman who seems to be very healthy, and, and that's my friend, actually in a small way, a business partner, Hal Neller. Hal, welcome into this week in Radio Tech. Thank you very much, Kirk. How are you doing? And by the way, it's 77 degrees here in sunny Florida. <laughs> ah, what what town in Florida are you in? Punta Gorda. Punta Gorda? Let's yeah, see. For those who don't know, it's about 100 miles south of Tampa. And uh, we're both uh, Hurricane Charlie and uh, pretty close to Hurricane Ian Cape Shore. Punta Gorda, that sounds like Spanish for Fat Point. That's exactly what it is. And if is it, you... Uh, Look at a map of, of the city, uh, you actually can see that that point. Oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I thought it might be talking about some residents there, but no. It's, them it's, too. Uh, we, them we tend too. to eat well. <laughs> hey, Hal, uh, our show is uh, brought to us in part by our, our first sponsor. We always get this in real quickly so folks know about it because it's also valuable info. It's Nautel. And Nautel.com slash webinars is the website that you want to go to to check out Nautel's Transmission Talk Tuesday discussions. Now, uh, they had one this uh, past Tuesday. We've got another one coming up on December the 13th. So that's a couple weeks, but you want to go ahead and register for that now. You go to uh, Nautel.com slash webinars and click on Transmission Talk Tuesday. The um, It's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, it's actually going to be a little bit like our discussion here today with Hal, it's called Sight Stories. Sight Stories. And the uh, you know, the thing about Transmission Talk Tuesday, it's, it's not a webinar per se. It is a discussion. It's a roundtable discussion. Sure, they have some guests, some expert guests to kind of get the conversation going, uh, but you're welcome to take part as well. Uh, you want to raise your hand, Jeff Welton will let you in. If you've got a sight story to share, well, then you can do that on uh, on Transmission Talk Tuesday from Nautel. I can tell you, know, Nautel brings you a lot of cool things, not just the Transmission Talk Tuesday, the new VX series of transmitters, and of course, their high power transmitter series as well, AM and FM transmitters, and HD radio equipment too. In fact, at one of my stations, uh, my friend Russ Lafferty and Larry Fuss, my business partner there, uh, just installed uh, uh, HD. Uh, an HD1 and HD2 at one of our transmitter sites. So we're glad to have that on the air. And the HD2, I think I think they're running Christmas music already. Uh, well, I guess maybe it's time to <laughs> HD2 for American Samoa. So uh, again, nottel.com slash webinars and register for the Transmission Talk Tuesday coming up December 13th, Tuesday, December 13th. All right, thanks, Nottel, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech and for doing this these great services for our broadcast industry. 
All right. Hey, it's Kirk and Hal today. And Hal, we got a theme today that you suggested a few weeks ago. And why don't you tell me, uh, you know, what was your inspiration for, you know, five things you need to know about FM transmitter sites? Well, why did you choose that? Well, uh, it just kind of depends upon uh, where you are and what you're doing. But there are a few things that I have found to more bulletproof sites. We're going to talk about some of them today. Of course, everyone talks about grounding. We're not going to talk about grounding today. And uh, people talk about, uh, uh, you know, different types of, of methods to help secure a site against surges, lightning, uh, power bumps, whatever. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those today. And also uh, some things that can come down the transmission line from the antenna and fight you in an unfortunate place. So, uh, that's kind of our, our topic today. We've got some pictures. We've got a couple of stories, and uh, we'll we'll just kind of chew the fat for the next hour. Yeah, you know, this this sounds like the kind of topic that how you know I think I probably know everything about it, but that's never true. Whenever I listen to like Jeff Welton or John Bissett or someone else talk about uh, things that you need to do at your transmitter site to to keep it secure, to minimize risks from lightning flood fire you know uh, the short circuits uh, uh, well all the things that can be uh, you know hot air uh, an air conditioner breaking uh, air flow not working to, to understand um these risks and to better mitigate them i always learn something uh so how we're going to ask you to take us through a, a presentation i may interrupt you and ask a question or two along the way and hey um I, I just i just noticed uh if if you could lean forward to your mic just a bit more I think sure. you were just on the just on the threshold right. of it. Uh, yeah, uh, wanting no to problem. downward expand. All right, good deal. I, good deal. I, I need I need to call uh, one of your sponsors in order to broadcast microphone. <laughs> this, this little cheesy computer mic is not that great. Uh, hey, and by leaning and forward, were, we can see we, we can see more of your face anyway. So that's that's good. Okay, you were mentioning about uh, Nautel before. In fact, I'm waiting for a BSHD and a Multicast Plus to convert a station to. Uh, to HD radio in the very near future, as soon as the boxes arrive. Good deal. Good deal. I'd, I'd like to. That. I didn't. I didn't get to install the HD in American Samoa. Uh, my business partner Larry Fuss and my engineer friend Russ Lafferty did that. I remotely. I hooked up some uh, processing for that and kind of tweaked it a, a bit and, and got all that going. But uh, I got to hand it to, to Russ and Larry. I've actually never done an installation of HD. I've certainly adjusted a lot of processing for that, especially back in the early days of HD when we were comparing uh, our brand of processing, Omnia, with with some others. And uh, you know, I got a chance to you know, race and compare and A, B those things. But I, I have yet to install one. And I, I'm a little disappointed that I've never been around during the actual turn on of an HD station. Well, this will be my first one in the current generation. I did some early on in the, uh, well, early 2000s, 2002, 3, 4, as, as it was rolling out. But then uh, I haven't done any in a few years, so it's going to be interesting to uh, go in there and uh, actually get my hands dirty. Well, let's let's begin with your uh, presentation, and I believe you've also sure. got the controls to, to forward the slides. So I do. tell us what you want to tell us. All right. Bring it up. Uh, okay. So. We're going to talk about some uh, transmitter site protection things. And I, I said before, grounding is uh, a number one thing in site protection. We're not really going to have that as our topic today. And a common ground point is also important, but it's not what our real topic is. We're going to discuss additional power line protection and some RF transmission line protection. So uh, some things that people sometimes think about but don't always implement. And I have found them, especially here in Florida, in any place where you get uh, lightning, some of these things to be very important. At minimum, a TVSS type of surge protector should be at every transmitter site. And these are simply the most basic and, and lowest cost. There are other methods that can go up in price into the thousands of dollars. But I have found that uh, spending a few hundred dollars and, and protecting the main power panel uh, connected to a, a good ground in, in that has saved a lot of problems at transmitter sites. So I would say, uh, whether it's a single phase or a three phase site, uh, they make these, they, the, the one on the far right, uh, that, that's actually a Nautel surge protector that uh, oh. they sell with their transmitters uh, as an option. And I would certainly always recommend buying that if you don't have something put them already in circuit. Another thing that I like to do, uh, 
and this applies more to lower power sites where you put the whole transmitter on the UPS, uh, is a UPS. And I know some transmitters, as you get into the kilowatt, uh, two kilowatt range, require 208 or 240 volts. And that is not a problem because there's a lot of what they call international product for these UPSs because uh, I guess in our area of the world, we're one of the few countries that, that, that runs on 120 volts. So much of the world is running on 220, 230 volts. So uh, the UPSs are, are certainly plentiful. They're a little bit more expensive here just because it's, it's not a common product. This particular product here, I have used this one on AM stations with uh, one kilowatt transmitters and on FM stations uh, up to even as much as one and a half kilowatts. You can see it's from Amazon. It's under $2,000. This is a dual conversion system. That's important because it actually isolates you from the transmission line. Uh, the batteries are always floating and the inverter is always on. So whatever spikes or whatever comes in on the, on the mains is, is very isolated by the time it gets the output of this. So uh, you are assured a very clean power when you operate a dual conversion system like this. It's also hey, Hal, for site. I, yes, yes. I've got a question. Um, I, I, and I would say that if if you can't, I don't know what, how the Nautel transmitters are, the, the larger ones, I've only got sm some smaller ones. Um, but if you've got a device physically in the transmitter that runs off of uh, 120 volts, if you could get that over to the, you know, get the UPS power through that, you might be better off because so many of these, these lower level devices, <clears throat> whether it's an HD box or an audio processor or even some exciters, uh, it, they, they have a, a CPU in them. They, they're running computer software. And if you You're can absolutely right. prevent, yes. yeah, prevent them from having that short power outage, that's enough to screw it up and not enough to get it to fully reboot. Oh, what a mess. And of course, the fewer times you can, you know, yank power from it, you know, if it's doing a read or a write, yes, it's supposed to be okay. If it's got a Linux operating system and all that read write protection, but you know, that goes wrong once and you've kind of hosed your, your device, wh whatever it is. Oh, any kind of device with logic, uh, even older stuff that doesn't even have a microprocessor, just has, you know, the old logic stuff, uh, mm. and modern transmitters are, are CPU based. Absolutely. Power glitches can do the weirdest things to a transmitter or automation system or whatever. And you could try and try and try to duplicate that and it won't happen. Then one day it will. So yes, that's why I like these these online dual conversion uh, devices because they simply eliminate uh, whatever disturbances are on the power line and give you a very very clean uh, power source for whatever you're operating. And you know even you know whether it's studio transmitter site whatever it is, it's uh, it's really good. Uh, can we go back to the picture again? Thank you. Uh, now I'm mentioning this one here uh, because a lot of people say, well, I, I have 220 volts on my transmitter or 208 volts on my transmitter. So, you know, I can't really use the EPS very easily. And as I just wanted to point out that this is certainly available. Even if your site has a generator, you know, you don't have to be off for 10 or 15 seconds as the generator comes up and, and supplies power. Uh, this holds everything together during that, uh, during that period. What I like to do when I'm building out a site or doing a major renovation on a site uh, you know, the owner wants to know, how much is this going to cost? So I, uh, I do a spreadsheet and I try to put in everything. Um, I, I highlight things like the green highlights you see there. That's something that I've already purchased or already uh, have in, in house. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it. It's right there. One of the things that I do, and you see this big red arrow, is I have a UPS specified right there in the construction budget. So it, it isn't an afterthought. It isn't added later. Mm. Yeah. Another thing, some people will say, yeah, but you know, UPS is fail and then that's the thing that's supposed to keep us on the air and then it goes out and, and then we're off and I have to run to the transmitter site and bypass it, yada yada. Yeah, I hear you. And I've had UPSs do that. Um, now in more critical applications, uh, an automatic transfer switch is something that I've been putting in uh, at a lot of sites. And I'm going to show you some pictures in a bit. Uh, this is made by CyberPower, this particular model. And this comes in either 120 volt or 208, 240 versions, whatever you might need. 
it has uh, two power cords on it. One power cord I plug into the UPS. The other power cord I plug into a mains. And it's programmed to favor, you can, you can program it to favor whichever input A or B that you want. And I, of course, program it to favor, favor the A input, which is connected to the UPS output. Should the UPS decide to die, this thing will automatically switch you over to the mains, bypassing the UPS, keeping you on, and it's SNMP, it sends out emails or text messages if there's an issue. There's even some optional things like uh, temperature and humidity sensors. So you can monitor the site temperature, uh, know, for example, right away if you're getting an air conditioner problem or whatever. Just part of this is an option. You don't have to buy that little extra can this thing ties into uh into your uh your router and your your ethernet switch and you can program it to send yourself emails or it can be uh, run by an snnp management system it's totally programmable uh, very simple i mean I, the first one i did i think it took me an hour to set it up now i can set one up in about 10 minutes and <laughs> they, they're very reliable and uh it, it does take that extra precaution about the failure of the UPS putting you off the air. And of course, if that UPS does fail, this thing is going to tell you that the A power input has gone down and it has switched to B. And then when you get the A restored, you come up there and you fix the UPS, you place the UPS, whatever, it'll send you an email saying that A has now been restored and you now have power redundancy. So I think it's, uh, it's a very useful thing. You know, for what they cost and, and, and what they do, it's, it's great security. I don't see too many of them at sites, but uh, I've been incorporating. Hey, Hal, I, and I'll, I'll give a quick yeah. shout because we do have a sponsor, Henry Engineering, that makes something similar to that. It's not as fancy. It doesn't have Ethernet or SNMP. It does have a contact closure for what mode it's in. But it, but uh, it's uh, Henry's got one called the Back UPS, and it's the same concept. Uh, you get power from the UPS and power from the, you know, from around the UPS, you know, from the main commercial power and it, it switches, it can be automatic and you can make either one, the, uh, you know, the primary, if, if you will, but it, it lets you get the UPS out of the circuit or if it fails, so you could be on commercial power. Uh, I think exactly. the Henry one uh, has a max of 15 amps. And so others may have more and it doesn't have, you know, SNMP control, but, uh, I, I th and it, and it, but it's, it, it costs less than the one that you were showing there. So right, you have you a can, choice. Uh, you can get these in in several different amperages. I mean, you're not going to get mm. something that's going to run a you know 10 kilowatt transmitter. This this is this is all in the in the area for low power. Yes, you can get UPSs. We'll we'll look at one later that will run a whole television. Plan if you want oh, to. yeah. But primarily, okay. I'm I'm dealing here with uh, stations that are running lower power levels, uh, class A's, uh, translators, boosters, you know that type of kilowatt uh am stations uh, you know that type of thing yes there are products okay. for the high power we'll we'll look at a couple of those up uh, what's next could we go back to the yeah thank you this is this is the um gui on the ats thing you can see uh, on the left it's showing me the temperature in that room and i cut off a little bit when i did the uh pasting here but there's also it shows the humidity also, it has uh, the ability to set uh, notifications for temperature over or under a certain point, uh, line voltages over or under a certain point, as well as the fact that it's switching. And on the right side, you can see where the selected source is source A. That's what's on online. The preferred source is source A. You can see the line voltages. We can see the, uh, the current, uh, the uh, wattage being drawn. We can see, obviously, the line the line frequency is 60 hertz, and uh, it gives us a little history. We can see our maximum draw. We can see our high and our low temperatures. So it gives us all kinds of great information in addition to uh, the function of, of basically backing up your UPS uh, with the possibility that it fails. So I have a couple of racks where I put in the 220-volt uh, UPS. And I really don't want to have another UPS and another set of batteries. And I really don't have a lot of load. I don't have a lot of items to draw 120 volts. Yeah, oh, what have I got? Uh, maybe I've got an audio processor. Maybe I've got uh, an Ethernet switch, a router, a cable modem, or whatever I might have. It doesn't take much power. Uh, I have bought these transformers on eBay, and I've used them for a good number of years. I've never had a failure. 
This one here is good for 500 watts and it costs 40 bucks. Uh, huh. Now you hmm. don't have to have a separate EPS with another set of batteries. It's just a thought. Uh, it, it, it works very well. Nice. Now, when we're dealing with 120 volts, you can see this, this EPS, 1500 VA, or only $700 on Amazon. Um, I'm running uh, 600 watt uh, transmitters uh, on this. Uh, most of the ones that are a kilowatt and up do require 208 or 240 volts. So they probably won't work. But this is great for uh, exciters. All the equipment you can think of in your rack, 1500 VA. And, uh, you know, transmitters and exciters that are up to, uh, you know, a maximum power level that would still run on 120 volts. And there's some very nice features about, about these, these units. Uh, again, this is a dual conversion, so you're not seeing the, the line. Um, any any discontinuities in the line or spikes or anything else because the EPS is generating the output voltage all the time through the inverter uh, with the batteries floating. Um, and uh, I've, I'm running a 600 watt transmitter at almost 600 watts, uh, and this thing isn't isn't even breathing hard at one of my sites. Uh, I think yeah. I skip over. Well, I guess I did. Um, hey, tell you what, Hal, we're, we're going to take a, a quick break and hear from our, our sponsor, Broadcast Bionics. We're in the middle of, of hearing from Hal Neller. Hal has been a real expert in uh, in, in broadcast engineering. He specialized in, in all kinds of consulting engineering, practical hands-on engineering. Uh, he's actually one of our partners at our radio station, my radio station, in Hawaii, and he's offered some great advice there and, and great advice to, to engineers all over the country. Uh, Hal's in Florida, so he knows all about lightning and, and power outages and things like that. So we're hearing from Hal about those things. We're going to get into, uh, you know, uh, uh, the power coming in the building and RF transmission protection in just a minute. Our show this week in Radio Tech, number 621, is brought to you in part by Broadcast Bionics and the Bionic Studio. Pay attention. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bionic Studio. The Bionic Studio brings all audience interaction to the fingertips of a production team in radio, TV, and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralization, remote operation, scalability, and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single studio self-op environments. Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. Bionic Contest enables end-to-end -end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These could be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications. Everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI. And incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. Thank you, Bionics, uh, Broadcast Bionics and the Bionic Studio for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Boy, they've got a great uh, range of things to make your content creation better, easier, pretty much doing the same things that you do now. And by the way, uh, we're going to have Dan McQuillan on as a guest in the coming weeks. And Dan's going to describe to us some more virtualization uh, possibilities for your broadcast facility. You got to believe the world is going to that. We're not going to be screwing purpose-built equipment into racks forever. 
we're going to be going more and more into virtualized uh, systems that run on generic PC server platforms. And Dan McQuillan and Broadcast Bonics ha- are making that easy to do. So even engineers like me can really understand that and, and deploy it uh, without without any difficulty at all. All right. So stay tuned for Dan McQuillan coming up on a future show. We're with Hal Neller today. Hal is from Punta Gorda, Florida, and he's uh, a broadcast consultant to so many stations, and including one of my stations in, in Hawaii. So Hal, uh, we were talking about uh, power protection, and you were just moving on with that. Yes. In fact, I believe I skipped over one of the slides that had a lot of pictures. So I'm going to skip back to that. Uh, oh, yeah. I, you you're right. I there was one. Implement, uh, a few. This picture here. Yeah. Uh, we got yeah. Out. So these are three sites not real far from where I actually live. Uh, one in Bradenton and two in Sarasota. And you can see um, the uh, all, all three racks have, have a UPS. Uh, the one in the middle actually is, is is a transfer switch panel I built myself, and then I decided when I discovered that there was some commercial product out there that was a whole lot less work. Um, mine does give a, a, a closure for uh, for the remote control to be able to signal back uh, to me or anyone else that's uh, getting phone calls from it, that something or emails now uh, that something has awry. But uh, you can see the UPSs are in that rack, uh, all three of them. The... Um, the middle, the, the farthest one on the right, uh, that one has a, a kilowatt transmitter and it runs on 208 volts. And underneath that transmitter, there's a kind of a beige or cream colored uh, rack panel blank above the radio receiver. That has that uh, 220 to 120 volt transformer mounted on it. So all the plugs that are on the right hand side of the rack there that you can see where the stuff is plugged in are connected to the output of that transformer. Meanwhile, other than that, the whole rack runs on 220 volts, so to speak, except for what's connected to the transformer. So that allows us to uh, not have a separate UPS with another set of batteries. The other two translators that you see there, uh, they're both running lower power transmitters, so they are uh, running uh, 120 volt type uh, type service so we don't we don't require that extra 220 volt stuff um you can see these are you know they, they all have a fair amount of redundancy we have uh, two transmitters we have stl and internet backups and uh everything is uh, pretty redundant so we can stay on the air because the owners of these translators are uh basically cross service to an am station but their primary audience now on these FMs. So we consider this FM translator as important as an FM broadcaster who's got a higher power station, a class A or, or B or C station. We consider it just as important as that because the bulk of the audience today has moved over from that AM station over to these translators. So that's why we have the redundancy uh, with STL, with uh, internet feed, uh, with two transmitters, whatever it takes. Uh, of course, the UPS helps the uh, reliability as well, even though uh, two out of those three sites uh, have good generators. So that's really my uh, my story here, that, that uh, these owners want this to be as reliable as possible, and eliminating power issues is is certainly part of trying to maintain that reliability. Mm, Let's mm-hmm. go past where we were. Okay. Yeah. I like these APC uh, UPSs because... They report into a central server at no cost to the customer. So you go in there and you configure and you set up a, a profile for your station. And you can have these multiple sites as we do. In fact, you can see here, it says Bradenton, Studio, and WBIJ. So there's three separate sites with three, uh, three different UPSs that are all configured to this one APC page, and all of those can be programmed for sending out uh, messages, whether it's a uh, email or you can put in the equivalent to get a, a text to your phone. Uh, it, it gives us uh, all kinds of information. We can go in there and look at a log at any time. It gives us warning when it's time to do battery replacement. Sure, individual UPSs can be connected uh, to networks and to uh, computers and, and send out this, but 
I like how this is all just all, all in one place, easy to use, easy to see, easy to manage. And here's a, an example of an alarm lock from one of our sites. In all of the cases, this is a, a power uh, loss, UPS on battery, power restored. None of these are, are long. Um, they're all glitches. I wish actually there was a way that I could tell it, hey, the failure's under, say, 10 seconds, don't bother. But they don't have that. All right, UPSs. You saw some little tiny ones on oh. a rack. Cost, uh, you cow. know, a thousand or two thousand dollars. Here's one that'll that'll run a large television station and an FM and whatever else you got. They come in all sizes and all shapes, and I don't think any of us want to know the real cost of this. But uh, in the area that I've been working with these lower power stations, uh, kilowatt AMs uh, and FMs, uh, translators, boosters, uh, the technology that I've been talking about here with the online UPS works very well. And this is something that also can be very helpful. Antennas, even if they're grounded, we all know they try to have a DC ground up there on the tower. And even on the tower itself, some of them have waterway stubs at the top. Certainly not the ones that are multiple frequency antennas because a waterway stub is going to be very tight to a specific frequency. So master mm -hmm. antenna, you're not going to have that. Uh, these are quarter wave shorting stubs. I first found out about them by reading John Bissett's column in Radio World. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. Because I've actually installed a couple uh, of these in old transmitters uh, that used to be used really to notch the second harmonic out. All the old tube transmitters uh, back in the day used to have uh, these quarter wave stubs either inside the cabinet, the transmitter, uh, which uh, looked like the one of made of the transmission line way up on that top left picture. And then as the solid state transmitters have come into the world in more recent years, they don't need the second harmonic suppression natively they're they're clean enough they they don't generate the harmonic energy that the old tube transmitters generated so they got away from them well these quarter wave stubs are a direct short circuit uh, to dc uh coming in the line or power any kind of surge coming in the line they are uh, an open for that frequency that they may be set to uh, your carrier frequency but anything else coming down that line, uh, spike from lightning or anything else, it just shuts it right down there, sends it to ground. And this particular product, uh, you can use for almost any type of, of situation, whether it's an end connector on an STL uh, transmitter or receiver. Uh, you can use it on a translator or even up to three and an eighth inch uh, high power transmitters. And there's a very interesting video uh, you can see the website, uh, Centerad, I think it's pronounced, uh, on the bottom there. And if you go there, there's a YouTube video where the guy actually generates 5,000 volts and sends it through a piece of transmission line to his quarter wave stub to a um, oscilloscope. And you can watch the output of, of this thing into the scope and... There's literally no voltage coming through that <laughs> stuff. It's a very, very yeah. effective demonstration. So uh, I've actually put a couple of these in, and they work very well. I, I'll Another put a link to that in the in the show notes. I'll I'll have, I'll have, have a link to that. I got a quick question about. Yeah. Do, do you want to calculate the length of the quarter wave stub? And if so, do you have to take into account the velocity of the type of coax that you're using, whether it's you know a transmission line or 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 coax like we saw the the rolled up one. Um, or, or well, do you that, want to buy that something that's already frequency. made? That one's fixed. Uh -huh. The rolled up one. Okay. That's, that's for a 950 megahertz STL and it's, it's suitable for the whole band, but is it? not oh. so for a transmission okay. line where you're sending out a given frequency on an FM channel. So okay. those are tunable. Um, yeah, you can, you can do the math and calculate what your quarter wave length is for a specific transmitter frequency and set the thing close. And the way to zero it in is, uh, and this is a cool trick with antennas. 
you can you can tune that quarter wave stub to zero out your reflected power, which is another fine thing. So um, I've got an I've got a five kilowatt FM transmitter. Uh, when we replaced the antenna, uh, and I and I had removed the short on that stub so that it was basically out of the circuit because I wanted to make sure the antenna was okay. Uh, we had like thirty watts reflected power on four and four point eight kilowatts forward. Well, not terrible, but it's you know thirty watts. So by putting that quarter wave stub back into service, uh, we simply used the little Allen wrench, which was used to, to secure the center of that transmission line, we nulled out the trans the uh, DSWR and we have zero reflected power on that transmitter. And you can wow. do that uh, even with the end connectors. They make them in DIN, whatever, 7.8s. You can tune that stub to basically make your transmitter see a perfectly flat load. Now, hey, you don't uh, want to do it. Yeah. If you've got a major antenna problem, that's not going to yeah. solve the problem. But, you know, if everything's working pretty well and you got a little reflected power, bang, it's gone. Hey, Hal, I, I, I just remembered uh, the way I fa- you the way I found out about quarter wave stubs was I bought somebody's used uh, Gates FM transmitter, the one that that had the, the, the T contraption at the top. And the one side of it was the quarter wave stub. and The other side was a low pass filter uh, exactly. that would would filter the third, fourth and fifth and so forth harmonics. Well, I, I, well, I bought it used. And we were taking it to a non-commercial FM at the low end of the band. Well, I, I bought it. We put it in the in the back of a U-Haul, hauled it from Georgia back to Kentucky, West Kentucky. And I'm putting it in, and I think, okay, I'm going to have to adjust this, uh, this quarter-wave stub up here. And the station we bought it from was at the high end of the band. And there was barely enough room for it in the building, and so they had sawed off the unused inner conductor on the – on Ouch. the quarter wave stub and you know, i would i needed more of it for the low end of the band yeah you did so i i forget what we did we ended up just you, somehow affixing some tubing to it and making it work but uh yeah so that's where i learned about quarter wave stubs and that's what i was talking about before in the old days when we installed these two transmitters they came with quarter wave stubs and yeah yeah it was primarily there for the second that's why they were primarily there, but they also provided yeah. an extra level of protection from any surges coming down the line. With some uh, FM antennas, I know I've bought ERI antennas that had the option of a uh, quarter wave stub, at, like at the top of it or something. But I'm glad you mentioned that you can put it on STL lines. That's uh, that's and a ham radio operator would know this, and I don't always think in those terms. So it's it's good to be reminded that you know it, this is effective on any transmission line where you've got one frequency going on, not not a multiplicity of them, but one frequency, and you can right because can the stub, that way. you know, the stub is. Not broadband. I mean, you might have it tuned for uh, one FM channel and, you know, 200 kilohertz over to enough, the next channel. It might be close enough, but, uh, you know, it's definitely not going to work across the band without retuning. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Go go ahead. No, that, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, the STL ones, uh, as I mentioned, that's the one with the little coil. Uh, looks like a little snake there. Those, mm-hmm. those are... You just basically insert that where the antenna would plug into the back of your STL transmitter. You just they give you the adapter and everything. So you plug that in and just hide that that little little coil in the rack. And there's a quarter wave stub at 950 uh, to protect uh, an STL receiver or tra- or transmitter. It doesn't matter uh, from lightning uh, or any other surge that uh, might be out there. You know, you don't even have to have a direct strike on your antenna, uh, something close that generates enough, uh, of a pulse that it's, it's picked up by the antenna and sent down the line. So this will, will cancel that out. Uh, it's not tunable. It isn't needed to be tuned because the STL frequencies are so high and the band relatively small that, that the length of transmission line from low end of the STL band to the high end of the STL band, uh, is, is perfectly adequate, so it doesn't need to be trimmed. Uh, you can build these things too if you want to. I mean, it's a, it's it's a it's a little bit tedious. Uh, you can take a piece of RG8 or something, and you know, start long and 
with a bird watt meter or something in there, you can uh, you know, trim the length, shorting the, the shield to the center conductor and just keep shorting the length until you get to zero reflected power. And then you're there. But uh, this, is, just, this is a just to make easy. Just to make sure I understand something, the quarter wave stub is pretty much invisible to the desired frequency. So that's why it doesn't Absolutely. affect... You, you know, like let's say I have a transmitter, uh, a, a, a kilowatt on 92.7 up on a mountaintop somewhere, and, and, I, and I add a quarter wave stub, but it does present um, a, a short or a near short or some impedance to ground. It does present that to other frequencies. So yes. it can, it, it's not meant to be a, a, a band pass filter, but it effectively ends up being uh, a band pass filter. I, I think. You know, Shane Toven, who's a, a friend of this show, he's been on before, he'll be on again. Uh, Shane uh, installed a transmitter um, or was working with a transmitter a, a, on in, in Pongo Pongo American Samoa for uh, K-Love. And he was noticing uh, that there was some um, intermod. And he, he made a, a quick fix. He put a quarter wave stub in somebody's one or two different transmitters there and really reduced or got rid of, of the inner mod. Frankly, there should be, you know, some some tuned cavities there and there's not. There's going to be. Uh, but but he made a, a, a quick fix uh, on the spot. Sometimes that, that works uh, as long as there's a decent frequency spread. Um, yeah. You know, the yeah. problem with a quarter wave stub is it, it has tremendous reduction at the at the at the second harmonic tremendous uh you know like 40 50 db uh right doesn't have tremendous reduction two or three megahertz out so i've just got you yeah it's not a, it's not a bandpass filter uh, as you were describing with the cavity and it's not designed to be nor will a bandpass filter do what we're talking about here which is basically eliminating potential of lightning surges coming down the ah yeah yeah so, so so the stub looks like a short to th to uh what's well, the second harmonic yeah yeah a and, and 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 to, to easier mm -hmm. ac voltages that may be induced so so here's the trick if you take an ohm meter and you disconnect let's say uh this stub from the transmitter you just mm -hmm. you just have it sitting there uh, on the bench with nothing connected to the input of the output and you take your mm -hmm. ohm meter and you go across the center conductor to the to the shield to the outer conductor you've got a dc ground period i mean it's that's what it is it's a dc ground and that's yeah. that's the yeah. beauty of it but uh, somebody way back uh, way before we were born figured out that somehow or another uh at the tuned frequency it's invisible really that's that's the way it is it's invisible at the tuned frequency um, and this is, I actually have had this happen once before I had a, you know, tower crews very widely in their technical expertise and they're not expected to be, you know, high end technicians, but I have had a tower crew say to me, well, here's your problem. Uh, your transmission line shorted. We unhooked it from the antenna and we tested it and it shorted. Oh, well, that's the quarter wave stub. Or maybe they were measuring the antenna and it was an ERI, which would normally would uh, would show an open, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the, the rototiller style. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't will, have a it strap. It will without the quarter wave stub. Yeah, yeah. They, anyway, they they were unaware of the quarter wave stub, and so they misreported, or well, they accurately reported what they found, but that was a misinterpretation of what they should have found. So anyway, hey, and we're going to take a... a, a they, they, uh, uh, for example... Uh, Mm -hmm. One that I work with, in fact, I'm going up to install one this weekend. Uh, the the Harris Z transmitters mm -hmm. have a uh, DC ground on their antenna input. However, in Florida, you know, I'm I don't I don't trust anything. It isn't really heavy duty because we get some really intense lightning down here. And I did talk with Jeff Mendenhall way back when we were buying those 25 years ago. And I said, so tell me about how that DC ground is. Well, it turns out it's a piece of number 10 wire. Well, a really bad lightning strike can vaporize a number 10 wire. Oh. So that, to me, isn't, isn't an adequate lightning protector. And it wasn't really yeah. designed for lightning protection. It was designed as part of their low-pass filter circuit. Uh, but it did offer a DC ground on the output. I just feel that gotcha. water wave stub gives you far, far more insurance than a piece of number 10 no copper wire. How, when we're talking about uh, FM and FM transmission, we do need to be concerned about proper uh, modulation. 
and proper uh, uh, subcarrier injection and proper uh, 19 kilohertz pilot. And some of those things, you know, we don't always, uh, it, it, a lot of transmitters have a modulation meter on the front, but that doesn't help you so much with uh, checking your RDS injection, things like that. Well, Innovonics, a sponsor of This Week in Radio Tech, has got some terrific, beautiful new solutions for that uh, f- that came out earlier this year. Let's hear from Innovonics. We'll be right back. <music> Hi, this is Gary Lerman. I'm Sales and Marketing Manager from Innovonics. I'm joined here by our President and CEO, Ben Barber, and we're here to tell you about two new products that we're very excited about. They're HD modulation monitors, the Model 551 and 552, and Ben's going to take us through some of the features. Ben, what can you tell us, tell us about these? The 551 has the big display, 7-inch touchscreen display. You can look at different parameters instantly by walking up to it and touching it, giving information that you need. It also has the LED displays for FM total modulation, uh, left, right, FM, HD 1, 2, 3, and 4. The other thing that the 551 does is that it has full-time audio outputs on studio hub connectors on the back, both analog as well as AES digital. So you've got FM, HD 1 through 4, they're full-time. The 552 doesn't have the display, doesn't have the metering, and doesn't have the full-time audio outputs, but the web interfaces are identical for remote viewing and monitoring. Great. Thanks very much, Ben. These products are going to be available in January 2022. Contact us at innovonicsbroadcast.com for more information. Thanks very much. And thanks to Innovonics for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Of course, if you want Innovonics, where are you going to get the best price? Where are you going to get a qu- good delivery and um, and people that you like to talk to on the phone? And that's Broadcasters General Store. You can call them at 352-622-7700. I've had that number memorized for probably 30 years now. <laughs> 352-622-7700 or bgs.cc. Thanks a lot, Broadcasters General Store, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech along with Innovonics. Uh, okay, we're talking to Hal Neller. And he's uh, advising us on things we should be aware of for our transmitter sites. How we've, we've covered uh, UPSs and some surge protection and quarter wave stubs. Uh, also, power switching between the UPS and the commercial power in case the UPS uh, turns belly up. Uh, what, what, what else should we be talking about for FM transmitter sites? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I was just thinking when you were doing your broadcast general store thing there that so uh, quarter wave stubs that I showed you the picture of uh, mm-hmm. are actually available. At oh, but, okay. Uh, Good deal. Yes, uh, that they're they're one of the links on this website. Wow, uh, you know, grounding is something that I said we wasn't really our primary topic here, but one thing that I have found over the years as an older site, you can actually have a deterioration of the ground system. Uh, uh-huh. the ground rods, uh, I've seen people throw salt on the ground around, whatever. But, uh, after so many years, uh, I'm not sure what the chemical action is or whatever, but you begin to build up some resistance between the soil and, and the ground rods. So it's a good idea to, uh, uh most people don't have the equipment, but, uh, some, some consultants do, uh, to check actually the effectiveness of resistance of your, of your ground system. Make sure that indeed you are having ground system. You think you have it may look like it's there, but is it really performing? And uh, in some soil environments, it's it's worse than others. So it's something to check over the years to make sure your ground your ground rods have not uh, deteriorated with uh, respect to conduct soil. Is that something that that you can test with a, a piece of equipment like a, a a megger, or do you really need to take a look and grab the rods and feel them? Or it, what are some things we can do to to say, "Yep, this ought to work well," or "No, nah, this is going to need attention." I don't really know the name of the machine. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a megger, uh, but I did see a thing down in the Virgin Islands where we were doing a ground system, and uh, the consultant had a box and it was an electronic test gear. He actually could measure, uh, you know, I, I, it put out some kind of a voltage. And I asked him, could I do this with my Simpson 260? He nah, that won't work. But uh, he had a box. I don't know what it is. But uh, huh. he actually identified uh, one of the ground rods. Uh, you know, we, we, we took loose uh, strap with rods, whatever, just checked them. 
worked on one of the rods was just not really conducting any any energy to ground. And we drove another ground rod in about uh, 18 inches from it, checked it, says that's good, right there. What can you tell me about, um, uh, oh, and I'm, for, I'm forgetting, <laughs> it's my old age getting up, catching up with me, the name of the process whereby you, you, you bond a cable to a rod uh, with Cadwell. a flash. Cadwell, Cadwell. thank Cadwell. you. Um, you know, that, that sure seems like the way to do this because mechanical connections, no matter how much you try to tighten them up over time, they're going to get corroded and loose. Right. A lot of them are out there with acorn connections and that's, that's not really good. Um, I didn't have a CAD weld, so I, I have actually braised, uh, you know, the same way I would braise a copper strap to a copper strap or, or, or ground wire on a DM, uh, to a, uh, copper strap. Uh, I've actually braised uh, wire to a copper weld ground rod, uh, and that's worked pretty well. Because I agree, I don't like eight. Uh, you no, know, they're easy, but yeah, you know, they're not good over the years, especially to get into salt air. What one thing that uh, as engineers, now this has bitten me a, a, a bit. We build a transmitter site, and if it's an AM transmitter site, well, grounding is just kind of part of it. I mean, because that's part of uh, you know of, of what your AM system needs in order to work. So as you know, I've built, it's been many years, but I've built several AM transmitter sites, and of course the 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 radial ground was part of it. But we'd also sink plenty of ground rods in places that made sense because that's a little bit different kind of grounding than you get with the uh, all the radials going out, uh, which is more of a cantilever. But um, uh, when you build an FM site, you don't need a ground in order to transmit. You know, the, the coverage to a listener at home doesn't get any better if, if your site is well grounded uh, until there's a lightning strike. <laughs> then, then your listeners at home may not get anything. So um, <clears throat> sometimes I feel there's, there's less motivation to take care of your grounding properly at an FM site when, because if you don't do it today and you don't do it tomorrow, you don't do it the next day, probably nothing bad's going to happen. But when, you know, the thunder and lightning and mother nature comes along, uh, then it, things really, really bad could, could happen. Well, you know, the, the difference between an AM and an FM ground system, uh, it's one of the SBDSA questions, by the way. Uh, uh huh. Yes, because I remember having it on my exam years ago, <laughs> senior exam. Uh, you had to draw a diagram of the difference between, you know, one and the other. But in any event, uh, even an AM system with all of those 120 radials, sometimes people put in an extra 60 and the ground strap that goes around it. Sometimes they put ground mesh down the tower. That's not a mm-hmm. lightning ground. Even though those uh, wires may go out six inches underground for, what, 200 feet? 300 feet, depending yeah. on the frequency, what, what the quarter wave is. If you're down at the low end of the band, those things are long. They're not a lightning ground. You've got to get depth uh, on, on a lightning ground. So even even with all of those feet and feet of copper in the ground, you really want to have uh, a good number of ground rods sunk and, and bonded to the uh, strap that goes around the base of the tower. So that, that's what's going to really sink their light. On FM, it's the same mm-hmm. rule. Uh, that tower, uh, you know, it's a 200 foot, 300 foot, 1,000 foot lightning rod, whatever it happens to be. So you want to do the same thing. And a multi point ground system uh, is definitely suggested, not one just ground rod connected to, you know, the tower, uh, Cadwell to the tower, but a series of ground rods going out so many feet, uh, at least three or four feet apart, minimum. Uh, around the tower, uh, minimal, I would say four, some more than that, they, they go out further and that just gives you a, additional grounding. Uh, then that's not a bad thing, but I've seen plenty of them just a few feet apart, yeah. and, uh, three or four feet apart with four, four ground rods. And they do very well. A lot depends on the soil, you know, uh, oh, you yeah. can have yeah. soil in some places, you can drive a ground rod down there. Uh, it takes a lot of work in that rocky soil to get a ground rod down. And it, it, it doesn't do nearly as good job of grounding as here in Florida. Oh, it's so easy to drive ground rock where I've been. There, there are exceptions to every rule, uh, but one of the things that I've noticed, uh, and if you've not seen a well-grounded site, 
you should try to get a tour of a cellular site. Not, not everyone is well, well grounded, but many, many of them are, especially I found the older ones. A lot of, a lot of the installations that are 20 and 30 years old for cell sites, uh, they really did use a lot of best practices, uh, according, according, uh, maybe to, uh, Motorola's handbook. Uh, and I've, so I've, I've learned a lot just by observing, um, cellular sites and how they were grounded. Uh, I'm not saying they were perfect. I'm not saying that they were any, even appropriate for, for AM radio stations, but if you're running an FM station and you want to make sure it's, it's well grounded, I think you can, um, uh, learn a few things from looking at a well grounded cellular site. Would you agree? I agree. Or not? Uh, there's an AT&T site, uh, one of those towers that we have, uh, uh, a transmitter at five kilowatt FM transmitter, and uh, it's one of those prefab buildings that they you know brought in it set on a pad. Uh, they put in multiple ground rods around the thing, and uh, coming out of the building at, at several different places, you can see ground wires going and connecting uh, to these ground rods. The other thing they do inside the building, which is not something that I've ever seen in broadcast, but uh, mm -hmm. up near the ceiling, they run uh, a heavy uh cable you know like uh two watt three watt uh wire copper wire and they run that around the whole perimeter of the inside of the building not too far down the ceiling and they attach racks or whatever they've got there cabinets uh they attach them up to those uh those ground ground that ground bus so to speak and yeah uh, as i say in broadcast we don't typically do it that way we use copper strap we run it along the floor and we bond it to common ground, which is uh, the appropriate and proper way to do it in our world uh, because the width of the copper strap, the skin effect of the RF, it's a much better ground than a, than a piece of wire. Hey, Hal, we're going to do a little unboxing here. Uh, one of my sponsors is Angry Audio. I just saw Mike Dosh yesterday, and uh, or was it the day before? But anyway, one day, and uh, he, he said, hey, this is not on the website yet, but go ahead and talk about it. I said, okay. So let's, let's do an unboxing. It says USB uh, analog audio gizmo. So we're going to open this thing up, and uh, okay, there's what's inside. Let's, uh, let's get the, pla the uh, bubble wrap out here and see okay we have a box and it's in a plastic bag the pink plastic that's supposed to be slightly conductive keep static down this is the usb analog audio gizmo and i uh it's got just three connections it's got a usb connection and it comes with the usb cable usb a to usb what is that called d i don't know whatever that is um anyway and uh then it has Ooh, it looks like Ethernet, but it's not. It is uh, Studio Hub, analog in and out. Now, I said, Mike, he said that th this costs $300. It's $299 list price. Get your best price from your dealer. It is, it's heavy. He took this apart for me and showed me. It is very well uh, RF sealed. Uh, it'll you know run right next to a transmitter, no problem. And I said, what, what's special about this? He says, here's what's special. We designed this so that the USB ground and the audio ground are separate. And that means so many times you use an external USB audio interface and you get little whines or clicks or buzzes. And I've heard them before. I've had them right here in, in my office when I hook speakers up to uh, almost anybody's uh, audio interface, USB interface on uh, onto my uh, my MacBook. I get, uh, I get a whine. Well, this, he said, won't do it because they're separate grounds between the analog ground and the usb ground and it says you're going to be impressed with the audio quality here the usb analog audio gizmo from angry audio they're just now getting ready to ship the first ones of these so talk to your dealer about this hey if you got to know it's got a part number of 991050 if you got to tell your dealer 991050 because it may not be on their price list yet it's not on the website but you saw it here first and look it even comes with a couple of the um, Studio Hub adapters from uh, the the studio the RJ45 to XLR male and XLR female. So check that out. Thanks you very much, Angry Audio, for another new product. Uh, and go to angryaudio.com. You can see the headphone disconnector. The U uh, you can't see the USB analog audio gizmo, but it'll be there uh, sometime this month. Check it out. Hey, we also are uh, sponsored by Josh Bones Max Connect Wireless. Here's Gary Morrill to tell you about it. I'm Gary Morrill. 
Midwest Regional Director of Engineering for Alpha Media. When I first spoke with Josh Bone about Max Connect, he told me they'd work great for remote transmitter sites where connectivity was a challenge. And you know, he's absolutely right. We even have sites where we're using this as a backup to our STL using Max Connect's dual carrier option, and it works perfectly. We also have times where we need to be able to get out to a venue where it's kind of challenging because everybody and his brother is trying to stream video at the same time, like at a big sporting event. And you know what? Our data gets through every time because it's prioritized packet data. It works for us. It'll work for you. Max Connect. Check it out. And just like Gary, I've got one too. This is the very one that kept WEVL on the air for a weekend and a few more days uh, because their uh, their internet went out and it worked perfectly. Kept WEVL in Memphis on the air during their pledge drive. So thanks a lot, Josh Bone, Max Connect Wireless. Go to maxconnect.com. Yeah, I know it's spelled all funny. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. And it works with your favorite carriers, fixed IP address, and yeah, you can do port forwarding, uh, which you can't do with uh, a lot of the other systems that are out there. You know, the home internet and things like that, 5G home internet. Nope, can't do port forwarding uh, from some of those. So check it out, Max Connect. All right. Hey, Hal, we got to wrap it up. Thank you very much for being with us. Is, is there a final thought you'd like to leave with our folks or tell us where people can reach you for consulting? Oh, uh, really? I think we've uh, expended all the thoughts, but uh, if somebody wants to reach me, my uh, email address is H M and my last name, Deller, K N E L L E R, at gmail.com. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Hal. We got to be out of here because uh, Catfish has a bar, uh, Catfish, <laughs> Suncast has a, a bar mitzvah to go to or something, uh, some kind of party. Maybe it's a skating party. I don't know. Uh, thanks a lot to Suncast for uh, switching and producing this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Hal, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you. Uh, your last effort uh, of appearing was uh, interrupted by a hurricane. So uh, it was, thank you wasn't for being... it? We had a lot of yeah. fun with that. We got to yeah. uh, talk about earboats getting to transmitter sites. And you did it from a transmitter side, which is pretty darn impressive. So thank, thank you very because much. It had hey, hope, my house. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully Chris Tarr will be back with us uh, next week. We've got some great shows coming up for you in the in the coming weeks. I was just going to look up real quick. Next week on the 8th, my colleague Ken Tankle is going to be with us talking about TV audio and a real quality problem that TV audio has. People are noticing this problem. And Ken has some ideas on how to deal with it. And then on the 15th, uh, virtualization uh, Nate, with Sasha Ludwig. He's an engineer from Germany. He's going to be with us. We got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.